I've been reading more magazines, and I hope that this segment will be of interest for a number of reasons. One is, I'm going to be using this particular article, and I'll tell you more about it in a minute, to tie together some concepts from the two previous articles or, or sets of articles as well as uh, some videos that I made some time ago on global and local feedback. You may recall from the last sequence of articles that I talked about the uh, Williamson improvements in my mind consist of three areas. One is the uh, output transformer, the second is the uh, phase splitter circuitry, and the third is the use of feedback. Well, what I'm going to be doing in this series is using this article to talk about the transformer. Now, in the previous magazines, in other words, magazines number two, I talked a lot about a series of articles on the phase splitter. So I'm not going to do that anymore, but I am going to touch on feedback. So the two things, the, if you will, the, the sort of uh, the theme of this is the output transformer and then a little bit on feedback. Now here are the articles that I plan to use, few less than previously, and partly that's because I'm going to spend a lot of time on this new 50 watt amplifier circuit. That is out of the December 49 issue of Audio Engineering, and I put this list up, so if you want to pause the video at this point and go look up these articles on AmericanRadioHistory.com, you can do so. At the top is a picture of a, an amplifier that Macintosh put out in 1949. It produced 50 watts, and the uh, you may notice that it's a somewhat unusual design. Basically, all of the metal down here is transformer. All of the circuitry sits on top of these transformers. Now, this was a uh, mono amplifier; it wasn't stereo. So, one of these transformers is basically the output transformer. The other one is the power transformer. So, what was Macintosh trying to accomplish, and, and how did he do it? Well, the problem that existed in the day was to get efficiency, you generally operated the output circuitry in class uh, AB. In other words, the output stages were not on all the time. You would turn one on for one side of the signal, that is one polarity, and then you would turn the other one on for the other polarity. The trouble was that when the, for example, positive polarity switched over to the negative polarity, there would be this little glitch. It was called crossover distortion. And what Macintosh was trying to do is to find a way to reduce this crossover distortion. So it occurred to Macintosh that one of the things you could do is to introduce a second winding, or a second primary, if you will, that could be driven by the cathode of the output stage. In other words, most output stages only drive the uh, primary of the output transformer with the plate. That eventually led to this circuit, which I'll show in just a second, uh, a, a, an expanded view of this. He used 6L6s in the output stage, and there's another one down here just outside the picture. But you'll notice that the cathode is connected to one winding of the transformer, and the plate is connected to another winding. The purpose of that was that the current flowing through the output stage would flow first through the cathode winding of the primary, through the tube, through the second, the the plate side of the the primary, and then to the to the power supply, to ground, and then eventually back to the center tap of the transformer primary. Macintosh showed this simplified equivalent circuit 
I'll show you one in a subsequent article that I think is easier to understand, but basically what he is showing here is that you're trying to put the load across this uh, inductor. The This is the uh, center tap. You drive one side of that inductor with the plate and you drive the other side with the cathode. Moving now to August 1955 in Electronics World, we have circuit features of high fidelity power amplifiers. And as you'll notice here, it says the basic Macintosh unity coupled output circuit. That's referring to the circuit that we saw in the previous article. So let's take a look at what he's, uh, what he's talking about in this article. And you'll notice that there is another winding shown that connects the cathodes. That is, the cathode current flows into this transformer, up through its primary, through the tube, to the other winding of the primary, and then to the power supply. This was a rather famous feature of Macintosh amplifiers of the period. And as you probably know, Macintosh became a very popular amplifier for the, for the day. But one thing that it's hard to see in this particular diagram is the cross-coupling. In order to illustrate that cross-coupling, I'm going to move forward to this May 1956 issue of Radio Electronics and an article by Joseph Marshall called High Fidelity Power Amplifiers. And in that, he shows a, a Macintosh design. And one reason that I like this particular description of the Macintosh circuit is it shows the cross-coupling. Now what I mean by that is the the screen grid of this tube is cross-coupled to the primary winding that drives the plate of this tube and, and vice versa. The cathodes are still connected through the cathode windings. So the current for the cathode flows up through this balancing resistor, and I'll talk about that in a second, and then through the cathode to the plate and eventually from the plate through this primary winding and back to the power supply. The power supply is connected to this line down here. So what's the purpose of this resistor? It is to provide a balance between the cathode currents of the two tubes. Now no two tubes are perfectly identical. So even when you use a matched pair of tubes, there's a slight difference in the current, particularly over the range, uh, over a particular power or a particular frequency range. The purpose of the resistor is to essentially provide a common resistance for the two cathodes that provides a certain amount of, of degeneration or negative feedback to help balance out the differences between the two tubes. But the reason that I show you this circuit and the reason that I picked up this particular uh, circuitry or this particular article about the Macintosh circuitry is to me it's easier to understand the way it is drawn here in a simplified form. So if you're interested in looking at this Macintosh uh, circuit, and by the way in the day it was called cathode coupling, so if you're looking for it in some other articles look for the, the phrase cathode coupling. Macintosh wasn't the only one to use this, but it was a characteristic of many of their amplifiers of the day. Shifting gears to the December 1955 edition of Electronics World, we find an article by David Haffler. Now David Haffler was one of the inventors of the ultralinear circuit that uh, we looked at in earlier videos on uh, magazine articles and other things, as well as some of the videos that I did on hi-fi tube amplifiers. It's termed high-power Williamson amplifier for hi-fi, but actually it's not a Williamson amplifier. <laughs> well, it's partly a Williamson amplifier, but it's actually an ultralinear. Let me show you. 
here is the schematic and as you will notice I realize this blue and white is a little hard to read but the output amplifier or output tubes are connected to a tapped primary where the plate is connected to the full winding and the screen grid is connected to the tapped winding on the primary. That is the classical ultralinear design and normally the tap was set at about the 40% point. It was regarded as the, the, the optimal or nearly optimal point on the transformer to produce the lowest distortion without unnecessarily restricting the efficiency of the uh, pentode or, or tetrode actually is the, the way that the, the tube is normally connected. The final article I'm going to talk about is from the September 1953 issue of Electronics World. Once again by Norman Crowhurst. I couldn't do a series without at least one article from, from my favorite author. And this is one of the best descriptions of global feedback and its advantages, at least certainly from, from the tube amplifier period. Now there are some very good texts and other things on uh, feedback amplifiers and on feedback and other things like control systems. But if you want to understand a little bit about the effect of global feedback on tube amplifiers, this article to me is the uh, place to start. It's called Why Feedback So Far? And basically the question is, why is it that Williamson, for example, and many of the people after that, fed all the way from the output of the transformer all the way back to the input of the first stage? And he discusses why that, that has advantages. He also talks about some of the disadvantages, like stability and transient response. So I recommend this article to anyone who would like a, a, an article from the day about the use of global feedback. I also suggest that you take a look at the videos that I did on uh, feedback in amplifiers. As I mentioned earlier, there's a, a playlist. I think there are two videos on the playlist. And uh, if you want to see the effects that are talked about in this article uh, in a, a laboratory setting, well, those are a couple of places to go. This is the end of what I hope is a series on tube amplifiers. We've talked about now the use of feedback, we've talked about the phase splitters, and we've talked about the output transformers. Those were probably the three biggest uh, building blocks or, or stumbling blocks in many cases to high fidelity amplifier design in the day, certainly using vacuum tubes. And while there are other factors, things like noise and hum, uh, other uh, linearity and nonlinearity problems and so on, those were the three that most people felt had to be solved to produce a true high fidelity amplifier. So I hope you've enjoyed this series. I'm probably going to change gears completely and if I do any more magazine articles, I think they'll be on a different topic. But I hope you've enjoyed these three, which have primarily focused on tube amplifiers. And I hope you'll stay tuned for some future videos, perhaps on another topic. In the meantime, have a nice day.